Hey guys, Canadian Range Nut here. It is Tuesday, June the 28th, 2022. Lots of stuff to talk about again today. It's going to be a pretty long show. So just a brief uh, intro of what I'm going to be talking about. First off, I want to talk about an article I found in Caliber Magazine um, discussing who specifically to contact as far as the MPs in Canada go and which uh, Liberal MPs would be important to contact as well as far as giving us a chance of doing anything against C21. Uh, number two is... Uh, uh, we're going to talk about the former RCMP commissioner who actually defends the superintendent who accused, uh, who's accusing Brenda Lucky of wrongdoing. So he's the old commissioner. Um, Trudeau talks about uh, his thoughts on uh, the trucker convoy, and uh, uh, you know he's trying to re-explain what he meant by calling them a fringe minority. Um, uh, and, not, and I'm not going to necessarily go in this order. This is just the stuff that I came across. Um, there's a video I wanted to share with you uh, of uh, in of um, uh, at the G7 with uh, Boris and Trudeau speaking and sending you know uh, positive thoughts to Ukraine. And w- once you hear the video, you'll you'll know why I, I played it because uh, it honestly sounds like a commercial for Ukraine. It's 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 kind of ridiculous. Um, next thing I want to talk about is Colian Noir and his views on the Supreme Court. And then I'm also going to go to Greg Gutfeld, Gutfeld's view on the what happened in New York. Um, Another video I came across was uh, from Blaze Media. Now, this is from an ABC local station uh, that Blaze Media picked up um, about the Uvalde shooting. And it talks about a mother who uh, the cops had originally arrested, like put her in handcuffs and then then they let her go. And she was actually able to go in and get her kids and a few other kids out of the school. And apparently the cops are harassing her now. So we'll go into that one. Um, There's a uh, a video I wanted to talk about called uh, the abortion battleground. It deals with both what's going on in the States with the abortion stuff uh, and relating it to what's going to happen in the States with the, uh, the voting uh, that's going to go on. Um, uh, t- also, in, back to Canada, Tamara Leach gets arrested again. And then there's also an interview that I wanted to share with you guys uh, where CTV is interviewing Candace Bergen and basically trying to uh, make the conservatives look bad for uh, linking themselves to the uh, to the trucker movement. Um, if you get any, any value out of this or if you haven't uh, already subscribed, please remember to like, subscribe, and please share so that we can get the, this message out there. I really do appreciate it. All right, so we're going to start with all the Canada stuff first here, and then we'll go to the stuff in the United States after. That way, you know, if you guys are from the States and you don't have an interest in the Canadian stuff, uh, that's cool. Just skip over it. And if you're in uh, Canada and you don't have an interest in the U.S. stuff, just skip over it. But we are, I think, as firearms owners, uh, all of this stuff is related, and I've said that many times before. Uh, First thing is, uh, this was an article I came across from Caliber Magazine, and it's by a guy named uh, Daniel Fritter. Uh, in featured politics, and this was released on June twentieth uh, this year. I'm gonna post this link in the description, so take a look for that because he did a great job with this article as far as uh, giving us advice on who we need to contact uh, as far as MPs and things like that. And he also went specifically into MPs that barely won their ridings last year. So I'm just gonna read a bit from this article right now. So it starts off. The following is a list of MPs who either have a disproportionate amount of input on Bill C-21's passage or who may be vulnerable to losing their next election as a result of how they may vote on Bill C-21. Note that it only includes those politicians from parties who have agreed to support the liberal gun control agenda. So the first person he talks about is the minister himself. As the Minister of Public Safety and the sponsor of the bill, Minister Marco Mendicino is the ultimate proponent for this bill and the person in charge of all gun control in Canada. Although currently in hot water for lying to Parliament and the Canadian people when asked to justify his use of the Emergencies Act to bring protests in Ottawa to an end, he's also been caught lying on the gun file numerous times. Although he's unlikely to withdraw support for Bill C-21 or amend it to exclude licensed gun owners from his new gun control regime and pivot it towards the criminals that use guns in the commission of their crimes, we should never let the the sycophantic and misleading behavior of our elected representatives dissuade us from being heard. So he gives Marco Mendicino's address here. I'm not going to say it because I'll just, again, I'll just put it in 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 the description for you guys. Here's the other people he talks about. So the Standing Committee on Public Safety Members. This is the committee that will be studying the bill in depth, calling and hearing from witnesses, and preparing the formal report and recommending amendments to the House of Commons. As such, these MPs will have an outsized impact 
uh, impact on Bill C-21's form and passage, and ensuring that they are well informed on Canada's existing gun control laws and precisely how Bill C-21 will do nothing to impact criminal use of firearms is paramount. So the names that he gives is uh, Jim Carr, who's a liberal with Winnipeg South Centre, Christina Michaud, who's from the Bloc, uh, Avignon, Le Mati, Matin, Matapadia, sorry guys, I'm terrible French, Paul Chang, liberal from Markham Unionville, Pam Damoff, liberal from Oakville, North Burlington, Alistair McGregor, NDP, uh, Cowichan, Malahat, Langford, Ron McKinnon, liberal at Coquit- sorry guys, Coquitlam, Port Coquitlam. Uh, yes, you can bash me in the comments for mispronouncing that. Uh, no problem. Uh, Talib uh, Nor Mohammed, that's the guy I played for you on the uh, in the last uh, podcast that I did with you guys, where he was uh, going against Danko. And then uh, Peter um, Scheifke, who's a liberal from Vaudreuil Soulange. Okay. And then it also gives a list of some of the vulnerable seats out there. Uh, I'm not going to go through that because that's just going to bore you. So what I will do is check the description. It'll, I'll put it right at, uh, actually, I'll put it right at the bottom of the description in, uh, on the channel when this gets released. And then that way, if you guys want to go click it, like I said, it gives the link, this article gives the links of the people's names and who exactly you have to email. So, uh, uh, he, it's a really, uh, he, um, this guy did a really good job on organizing this for us here. Okay, next article I want to talk about. This is from the Globe and Mail. Article's entitled, Former RCMP Commissioner Defends Mountie Behind Brenda Lucky Allegation. So if you don't know, uh, Brenda Lucky is the current RCMP Commissioner. And uh, there's, um, there's accusations that the Trudeau government was pushing her to release the types of guns that were used in the uh, Nova Scotia 2020 mass shooting um, while they were doing an investigation. So one of the uh, RCN, uh, the, one of the, um, the superintendent uh, had basically reported saying that she was doing this and it would have affected the cross-border investigation that was going on. But the apparent, apparently the Trudeau government had uh, pushed for her to tell the Mounties to release the names of the type of guns um, so that they could push the, uh, the, long gun, uh, the long gun ban and the AR-15 ban and all that stuff. <clears throat> Sorry, losing my voice here. So this was from June 22nd. Um, former RCMP Commissioner Bob Paulson uh, and other retired Mounties are defending the integrity of Superintendent Darren Campbell, who has alleged that current Commissioner Brenda Lucky interfered in the investigation of the largest mass shooting in Canadian history to help the Liberal government's gun control agenda. Emergencies Preparedness Minister Bill Blair doesn't accept Super, Superintendent Campbell's written account of a conference call on April 28, 2020, between Commissioner Lucky and RCMP commanders overseeing the criminal investigation into the rampage 10 days earlier by a lone gunman in Nova Scotia. 22 people were killed in the shooting. The dispute dominated the House of Commons question period Wednesday and prompted the Conservatives and New Democrats to call for parliamentary hearings to determine who is telling the truth. The opposition want to hear testimony from Mr. Blair, Commissioner Lucky, Superintendent Campbell, and other officers who were part of the April 28th call. Superintendent Campbell's notes say Commissioner Lucky told the RCMP officers that she had, quote, promised the Minister of Public Safety and the Prime Minister's office, end quote, that the force would disclose the type of firearms used in the mass shooting because it would advance the government's, quote, pending gun control legislation, end quote. Mr. Blair was public safety minister at the time. The RCMP officer recounted that Commissioner Lucky was upset because he refused to do so out of concern that politics could jeopardize the cross-border police investigation. Uh, and if you don't know, the shooter had gotten um, two semi-automatic rifles and two semi-automatic handguns, and they were all from the states obtained illegally. The gunman had smuggled three of the weapons into Canada from the United States. Oh, sorry, guys, three weapons. Um, I thought I heard four before. Mr. Blair questioned Superintendent Campbell's handwritten notes that were submitted to the Mass Casualty Commission probe. Quote, the superintendent obviously came to his own conclusions and his notes reflect that. But I'm telling you, and I would tell the superintendent if I spoke to him, that I made no effort to pressure the RCMP to interfere in any way with their investigation, Mr. Blair told reporters. I gave no direction as to what information they should communicate. Those are operational decisions of the RCMP, and I respect, I respect that, and I've respected that throughout, he said. 
The PMO, Prime Minister's Office, said Mr. Blair is speaking for the government. Mr. Blair has not said whether he or the PMO obtained assurances from Commissioner Lucky that the type of weapons used in the shooting would be quickly released to the public. In response to repeated questions in the Commons, Mr. Blair and MPs should ask the Commissioner, quote, the conversations between the Commissioner and her subordinates are something that she can speak to, he said. The... Globe and Mail asked Commissioner Lucky on Wednesday to confirm or deny Superintendent Campbell's allegations about the alleged promise to Mr. Blair and the PMO. She declined to answer, and RCMP headquarters pointed to what she had said in a statement Tuesday. Right there, uh, that, that's what they do. They don't answer, but always not a good sign when you're afraid to directly answer. Quote, the commissioner clearly indicated that she did not interfere in the ongoing investigation, nor did she feel any political pressure to do so, RCMP Media Relations said. In other words, that's what the lawyers told, told them to say. Mr. Paulson, who was a commissioner from 2011 to 2017, would not be drawn into the political controversy involving his successor, but he defended Superintendent Campbell, a former homicide investigator from the RCMP's Vancouver office, who he promoted and brought to headquarters in Ottawa during his tenure. Quote, Darren is one of the best investigators in the force and a highly reliable officer with tremendous integrity, Mr. Paulson said. You won't find a practicing police officer who will speak ill of Darren Campbell. Former Deputy Commissioner Pierre-Yves Bordois, I think is how you say Bordois, said there is no way that Superintendent Campbell would make up a story about Commissioner Lucky. Quote, this officer has a solid reputation, he said, and added, there is a blend of politics and a big political slant to it, and it is regrettable. Former, uh, former RCMP Superintendent Peter Lapine also spoke out in support of Superintendent Campbell. I followed Darren Campbell since the day he was a recruit, Mr. Lapine said. He's an extremely competent police officer and extremely well-trained in the world of major investigations. Mr. P Mr. Lapine said he doesn't believe Superintendent Campbell, quote, would falsify any notes or have any agenda to hang anybody out to dry, end quote. The recently released testimony is not the first example that the Nova Scotia probe has uncovered where Mounties recount the Liberal government's effort to exert control over the RCMP. In an interview with Commission investigators Leah Scanlon, the RCMP's former director of strategic communications in Halifax talked about the pressure from Ottawa. The transcript was made public earlier this month. Ms. Scanlon told the investigation that federal government officials, including Mr. Blair and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, quote, were weighing in on what we could and couldn't say, end quote, during media briefings. The transcript, transcript of her remarks was heavily redacted in some sections by the Mass Casualty Commission be, before its release, and so some details of the testimony remain secret. At another point, Ms. Scanlon talked about Commissioner Lucky's conduct in an interview and, and attributes what happened to, quote, political pressure, end quote, adding, quote, that is 100% Minister Blair and the Prime Minister, end quote. She then told investigators, we have a commissioner that does not push back. So she's talking about Lucky there. Bill Elliott, a former federal bureaucrat who became the country's first civilian head of the RCMP from 2007 to 2011, said he did not see anything wrong with Commissioner Lucky's conduct. I can, under quote, I can understand the reluctance on behalf of investigators to releasing information. I think it is appropriate for people like the commissioner of the RCMP to bring other considerations to bear, he said. The Conservative Party and the NDP are both calling for an emergency meeting of the House of Commons Committee on Public Safety and National Security to arrange hearings on the matter. Conservative public safety critic Raquel Danko and NDP public safety critic Alistair McGregor have both written Jim Carr, the Liberal MP, who chairs the committee, calling for a meeting as soon as possible. Under the standing orders of the House, a meeting of a committee may be requested by four members of the committee and one must be held within five calendar days to consider the request. Um, and it just ends there. So there you go, some more info on that. So obviously the superintendent seems to have pretty good integrity there. Um, when you have an old, um, a former police commissioner, uh, um, you know, speaking highly of him, it's just, and we know the reputation of the, the Trudeau liberal government, liberal governments in general, um, obviously, uh, who are we going to believe here? Now, obviously we could be wrong, you know, um, but it seems like there was some shady business going on. What do you guys think? Put it in the comment. Let me know what you think about that. All right, since we're on the topic of a uh, corrupt liberal government, uh, I'm going to play this clip for you when Trudeau was questioned about uh, 
uh, his comments back during the trucker convoy when he called people a fringe minority with unacceptable views. And I'll let you guys be the judge. So take a listen to uh, this one here. No, I will always call out um, unacceptable rhetoric and hateful language wherever I see it. And, and you will remember in the last election, uh, we saw an awful lot of it uh, during the campaign from people who, and we're not talking about, and I was never talking about uh, people who uh, are hesitant towards uh, towards a vaccine, but you know, trying to be reasonable about it and trying to stay safe. I was talking about those who were deliberately inciting fear and misinformation and anger and deploying themselves in, in extraordinarily unacceptable ways. Now, unfortunately- uh, For Trudeau, anything uh, going against him and his government is uh, unacceptable to him and uh, hateful as well. Uh, you, ever, you ever notice that? Uh, no matter uh, what you say, uh, you can say anything to a liberal. If they don't agree, it's, it's either hate speech, you're either a racist um, or one of those two. Unfortunately, uh, with the way, you know, the way our modern uh, social media and communications world, uh, that was picked up and conflated and extended on. And I'm not going to start to say I was taken out of context, but yeah. That's because it wasn't taken out of context. And do you guys remember when he said in the one interview to somebody, I can't remember who it was, where he was saying, uh, do we tolerate these people talking about like uh, the people who are anti-vaccine mandate and all that kind of stuff? And I'm not going to say anti-vaxxer because uh, uh, the trucker protest was more about anti-vaccine mandates. Obviously, you had anti-vax people in there as well. And hey, if you're anti-vax, good for you, man. That, that, that should be your right and that should be your choice. Um, let's just continue here. My point was that there are um, people who are deliberately trying to stir up hate and intolerance and misinformation, and we do need to call out those folks, even as we continue to do everything we can to reach out in thoughtful, reasonable ways uh, to people who do have worries or concerns and focus on allaying those. Don't you, do you guys remember when he was campaigning and he was talking about how people shouldn't be allowed to get on a train or on a bus if they weren't vaccinated? So really, uh, again, I love how these people, um, they talk about uh, the negative things that they themselves do. Like, sorry, he was the one spewing uh, division and hate through that. You're basically uh, splitting people into vaccinated, unvaccinated. And then a lot of people uh, buy that, right? And a lot of liberal-minded people. I remember a lot of people um, blaming others for other people getting sick. It's just getting, it's just ridiculous. It's worries and concerns. Okay, so that's the end of it there. Um, so what do you guys think of that? Uh, was was He didn't say it was taken out of context, but was he not talking? Was he only talking about a small minority? Um, I'm pretty sure he was talking about uh, uh, most of the, trucker, uh, the truckers. Now, I don't know if you guys heard this, but for Canada Day coming up, apparently there's going to be another protest. Now, obviously, Ottawa is getting prepared for that, and they're not going to allow vehicles in there and stuff like that. Um, I think they kind of learned their lesson from the the, the convoy in February because they realized how hard it would be to get vehicles out and stuff like that. But I was listening to uh, 680 News today and uh, they were talking to, to the Ottawa mayor who I think is also uh, not my favorite person, um, uh, a typical liberal-minded person. And uh, they were saying how they're, they're preparing for it. And uh, um, there's supposed to be over 100,000 people going to celebrate Canada Day, but they're also expecting a lot of protesters as well. So if something comes up with that, I'll, I'll keep you guys posted. Um, oh, since, and since we're on the topic of the, uh, the Emergencies Act here, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, Tamara Litch. So not much information has come out, but I just found out today. Now, this is from CTV. Uh, just says, uh, Tamara Litch, one of the organizers of the Freedom Convoy, has been arrested in Alberta for alleged breach of bail conditions, CTV News has learned. Litch was, or Leach, sorry, was released on bail after being arrested in Ottawa in February following the federal government's invoking of the Emergencies Act. And then it just says, this is a breaking news story, more to come. So I'll keep you guys updated there as well. Now, uh, there's a tweet from Glenn McGregor that says... Uh, and I quote what he says in the tweet. This appears to be an uh, this appears to be over an alleged breach of her bail conditions, possibly the restriction on communicating with certain named individuals associated with the Freedom Convoy. Um, so, and, and I guess she was arrested in Medicine Hat. That's what it says. Uh, which I guess kind of makes sense if that was in her bail uh, conditions. 
I'm guessing she probably was talking to those people, but again, um, I get we'll just we'll keep, see what's going on with that story, and I'll keep you posted there. Uh, one more thing with the Emergencies Act. Now, this is an inter- interview from CTV News, and uh, I actually like this interviewer because he usually takes people to task. He does the same thing with Bergen, uh, but he really actually took the Liberals to task. Now, uh, doesn't say his name on here, but you'll you'll if you if you've listened to my other videos, you'll, you'll recognize his voice right away. And he just calls into question why the Conservatives are teaming up uh, and supporting the people who are coming to protest again in Ottawa, and. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I get really uh, I get really pissed off when I'm listening to the radio. And obviously, if you're listening to a more liberal station, they're gonna or a more liberal host, they're gonna bash the trucker convoy, right? And uh, it's just a lot of it is just such propaganda. Um, and you know, it's funny. Like I remember when I was. Uh, uh, before the COVID stuff happened, I w- you know, used to think of propaganda as being like stuff from Nazi Germany and you know, uh, Soviet Russia and all that stuff. And it, you, then you realize it's alive and well today and all sides do it. Um, and I think that's why a lot of the smaller media outlets have really uh, started to come along. But um, anyway, just listen to this interview. Uh, this is with Candace Bergen and uh, a CTV uh, reporter here. Just in the last week, over 20 members of your party met with two, one person, James Stop, who was not part of the trucker convoy. I've spoken to him. He's a veteran. He's marched across Canada about mandates. But he, they also met with a guy named Tom Marazzo, who was a spokesperson, um, also a veteran, by the way, who I've spoken to. Um, this is a guy that stood in a press conference during the convoy and said he'd like to work in a coalition with your part, party, the Bloc, the NDP, to try to form a government. What does it tell Canadians that someone like you were with the truckers who took pictures, many of your members, and now here we are, 20 members, almost 20% of your caucus is out there essentially saying... Uh, as one member said, we're allies, you have their support. What does that tell you? Yeah, get- Oh, sorry, guys. I lost Very it. much support Canadians who are, uh, were and still are against the mandatory vaccines. We don't believe that they should be wedged, called names, stigmatized. We don't think they should be set aside. Our job is to listen to Canadians. We don't always have to agree, even with what they're talking about. We don't agree with everything that they want to do. But do obviously, you have credibility no. to people who are well, who are holding sorry, press conferences Evan, that are that are, that are trying to say we we want to form a government that would not be democratically Evan, elected. Evan, these these people obviously do not understand. They, I, I don't think any sedition charges were laid, were they? We're, we're, no, we're, they they were not. But doesn't have they, to be. But there are lots of charges laid against some of the some of the. But I think, I think this is the missing. Lead- so I like how it goes from sedition charges to basically well a lot of a lot of charges were laid after the fact. This Just is the misinformation that's, that that's, that's being spread. The people who protested here in Ottawa were there were as you know hundreds and thousands of them. They were upset. They wanted to be heard, and we as conservatives believe that they deserve to be heard. And they do deserve to be heard. And again, um, I've mentioned this in previous episodes uh, for any of you guys who are new here today. Uh, I was told I'm totally in support of the trucker protest. Um, I went to one of the, uh, the send offs where the truckers were. Everybody was nice, had no issues, went by myself, no issues at all. Um, and that's when I knew the media was lying about a lot of things because and that's kind of why I went. I wanted to go see for myself. So if I did hear any BS then I would know what really happened type thing. I also knew many people who actually went to the to the, to the Ottawa site on the first for the first two days and they basically said it was a big party atmosphere. Now here's the thing. With uh, the, emer- the Ottawa protest, a lot of people are like, well, it's causing inconveniences. Well, isn't that kind of the point of a protest? Um, look at the stuff going on in uh, Washington right now with the abortion stuff and mark my words, this summer is starting to feel exactly like the the BLM summer felt. Do you guys remember with the George Floyd crap? Um, Apparently yesterday in Seattle, there was a lot of uh, graffiti and stuff like that. And I'll talk more about that later in this podcast. And then in Washington too, a lot of graffiti in Washington and they're just starting to get more violent, right? And that's what the left seems to like to do. The trucker protest, I didn't see an incident of violence. Now, if, if I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, it was all peaceful, and that was their main thing. I followed a lot of the live feeds from it as well. Every live feed I watched, okay, um, it was people saying, you know, uh, make sure you're peaceful, make sure you're peaceful. Because, again, once you're not peaceful, you lose 
um, you're gonna you lose support, right? Uh, that, that's just how it works. So um, anyway, so that's it for the uh, the Emergencies Act. Now, this next thing I want to play for you guys. Um, this has to do with the Ukraine stuff. I find it interesting that you know um, our government is so willing uh, to send arms and guns to Ukraine. Uh, you know, for them to defend themselves against Russia. <clears throat> Again, I'm not going to pretend to know everything about that conflict. I've heard from different people uh, about who's in the right, who's in the wrong. But don't you guys find it weird that every, every second there's always a celebrity going to Ukraine? Like Ben Stiller went there, uh, I think like a week ago. And they did, um, what's his name? Uh, Zelensky did a presentation to the University of Toronto. And again, the thing that makes me suspicious is, again, I'm, suspi I'm suspicious of everything the media puts out. And I think you guys should be too. Uh, even stuff that I say, I always question everything that I say, right? I, if a person gets offended by being questioned, that's a problem, okay? It means you got something to hide. Um, or unless you've, you're 100% right on something and you, you have facts, right? But uh, so listen to this um, this video here. It says, we are with Ukraine and democracy. PM Trudeau and PM Johnson warn Putin. And I just think it's very laughable, but just listen to how fake this is. Hi, I'm Boris Johnson, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Et je m'appelle Justin Trudeau, je suis Premier ministre du Canada. And we're here in the G7 in Germany, but there's one world leader who can't be here, sadly, and that's our friend and colleague, Volodymyr Zelensky, president of Ukraine, who's been leading his people in their heroic fight against the unprovoked aggression. Is that, is that before or after he's meeting with uh, various celebrities? Of Vladimir Putin. And Zelensky's not just been standing up for Ukrainians as Ukrainians fight like heroes for their own land. They've been standing up for the principles and the values that bind us together as democracies, the rule of law, uh, the so uh, sovereignty, territorial integrity, the principe important for tout le monde dans le monde. What I love about this is the fact that, you know, they're fighting for their own land. Meanwhile, uh, we're, they're trying to, they want to ban handguns from Canadian uh, law-abiding uh, gun owners in Canada. These people don't really care about the, the working class type of person. Like, let's be honest here. Um, and the fact that, uh, again, they're, they're so proud of Ukraine for standing up for themselves, right? But I guess when we stand up for ourselves in Canada or the United States, then we're just uh, e evil people. And so here at the G7, we're showing more support for Ukraine, another half billion pounds worth of loans guaranteed, making sure we, together we sanction more Russian oligarchs associated uh, with Vladimir Putin, and also placing restrictions on Russian gold exports worth 13 and a half billion pounds. And do you guys remember, uh, I'm getting off, a little bit, not really off topic, remember the beginning of the Ukraine stuff? Now, what's it been, like two, three months? I don't even remember. Um, remember how ridiculous everybody was getting when we have to ban everything Russia? We're going to take the Smirnov off the shelves. And by the way, I went to the LCBO recently, and I saw Smirnov, and I saw Stolichnaya Vodka there as well. So I was just like, okay, so clearly that's not happening. Or maybe they changed that policy. I have no idea. Um, but remember, they, I remember they were going after hockey player... Um, uh, what's his uh, Ovechkin, right? And I used um, I used to follow hockey a lot, guys. But it's been a few years uh, since all the BLM stuff. I kind of stopped following mainstream sports. But um, they're trying to like blame Ovechkin and like uh, uh, saying, "Well, you can't play in the NHL." Now, if you don't see the problem with that, that's a huge issue because uh, so basically. Uh, and it's, it's starting now, but whenever it's like, okay, you're not you're not towing the line with the government, then we're gonna then we're gonna make you pay financially, which they did with the Emergencies Act, and then we're uh, you, you just won't be able to, to to earn a living, which they basically did with with uh, with the vaccine shots. And I know uh, a few people who actually lost their job, <clears throat> not personally, uh, friends of friends. Um, one guy I knew he was a contractor. He refused to. Uh, sorry, sorry. He was an engineer, and he was uh, he was the manager at this engineering company, and they let him go because he wouldn't get vac vaccinated. So, man, the hypo the hypocrisy here is just brutal. Anyway, let's keep listening. Yeah, we're increasing sanctions. We're stepping up with financial support, economic support, and military support as well. Il faut s'assurer que les Ukrainiens continuent de se battre pour défendre nos valeurs, pour défendre leur pays. And so our message to you, Volodymyr, and to, to the people of Ukraine is we salute your, your fight. We believe it's wholly, wholly legitimate and essential uh, for our world. We support and this music is actually connected to it because it's actually going into like a commercial now connected to the Ukraine stuff. you and we will stay the course. 
So here it's just showing the G7 leaders all smiling, all maskless, you know, like they did two years ago when everybody else had to wear a mask. Hi, hi, and that's the, that's the end of that one. Um, it, it's funny, like uh, sometimes I'll have like really far out there conspiracy stuff come out. And uh, this one guy I follow, um, I don't want to mention his name, but he, he talks about how like, the, you know, this is going to lead to World War Three. And you never know, this stuff could, right? Um, but what do you guys think of this? Like, do you think this is going to lead into something worse? Like if we look at the gas prices and stuff going on, I filled up my tank today and I drive, um, I drive a Honda. Okay. And it cost me, uh, now it wasn't totally empty. I had about a little over a quarter tank. It cost me $116 to fill my tank where two years ago that would have cost $80. Okay. Um, it's funny cause I used to do like Uber eats on the side too, uh, um, instead of my main job. Uh, so I would do it at night and it wasn't, you could make, you know, a decent amount of cash. And now I don't, I can't even bother because you're, you're not making any money because of the gas. So what do you, do you guys think uh, Do any of you think this stuff is something's going to happen? Like, do you think we are going to end up in world war three? What's, what's really going to happen with the Ukraine stuff here? I uh, just put it in the comments below. Now I know a lot of you guys are listening uh, to this in a podcast form. Uh, so you re- might not be able to, but if you do get a chance, uh, I do like uh, hearing your opinions on these things. All right, next thing we're going to move into is I want to move more into the the Uvalde shooting again. So this is an article I found on Blaze Media, um, and then there's a video connected to it from uh, the local uh, ABC station, um, and it interviews this mom who saved her own kids. So this is from from today. I always record a day before. This is from June 27th. So it says, mom who saved her own kids from Uvalde massacre says she's now being harassed by police. If you don't know who the Blaze is, it's um, it's Glenn Beck. Uh, it's I find it to be a pretty good source. They're usually pretty reliable. Um, obviously, it's more conservative. That's kind of what I listen to. I've tried to listen to more liberal stuff, but I just find they're so ridiculous. I try to get both sides of things, um, but it's very difficult today. I just find we're so divided as as a society. Um, so anyway, but check out the Blaze. They're a pretty good uh, a pretty good um, site to follow. So it starts off, a Texas mom celebrated for rushing into the site of the Uvalde Elementary School massacre said that she is being harassed by police and had to move her children for their safety. And uh, Angeli Rose Gomez said that she has been threatened by police and has faced increased scrutiny after she spoke to the media about how she saved her children. Hmm, That's interesting. In a media briefing on Sunday with her lawyer, Gomez detailed her experiences during an announcement that she was seeking to file several lawsuits over the massacre and the police response. Quote, the other night we were exercising and we had a cop parked at the corner, like flicking us with his headlights, Gomez said. She had previously claimed that a police officer had called her and warned that she might be in violation of her probation from an arrest a decade ago if she kept speaking to the media. She only began speaking to the media after being reassured by a judge that she would not be in violation of her probation. Okay, so this is kind of sounds kind of fishy. Now, maybe she's full of it. I don't know. Gomez went on to say that she had moved her children in order to avoid the intimidation and harassment from police. Quote, just so my sons don't feel like they have to watch cops passing by, stopping and parking, she ex- ex- explained. Mark DiCarlo, her attorney, said that he was representing about 15 parents of the Uvalde community. Quote, the fact that uh, Uvalde school police chief Pete Er. Eric- Arredondo wasn't fired immediately based upon whatever it is, hours of video from testimony such, uh, such as from Angeli is an indica- indication that there's some sort of what corruption uh, or wrongdoing, he said to reporters. Gomez has been praised for her defiance of police orders in order to save her children on the day of the massacre. She said that she, has been br- she had been briefly handcuffed by police who were preventing her from entering the school as the gunman was barricaded into a classroom. When she was released, she hopped a fence to gain entry onto school grounds twice and saved her children. Uvalde law enforcement has faced scathing criticism over the choice to wait outside the barricaded room while the gunman continued to shoot and kill children. Okay, and if you guys aren't aware, it took them over 50 minutes to go and do something. So um, I've said before on this show, like a lot of times you, when, when it comes to self-protection, you know, police are not gonna be able to get there in time. So you, sometimes you just gonna, you have to protect yourself, right? So it's good for this mom, it's a good thing she did that. Now, um, her suing the cops, are they really harassing her? Who knows, but this is uh, this is the video of her talking about it. 
And I'm like, what y'all doing? Like, what the f is happening? Like, and you could just hear, da 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 da. Can you hear kids screaming? This Uvalde mother took us through arriving at Rob Elementary moments after the gunman opened fire on students and teachers. Angeline Gomez says she saw law enforcement surrounding the school but not rushing in. Her overwhelming frustration landed her in handcuffs and when she was let out, she ran into the school and saved her children along with other students. She tells me her fight and struggle with law enforcement isn't over yet. Somebody jump out the window. Oh, the kids. They're getting the kids out. In that moment, I was like, they're really happy to see each other. So right now you're seeing a video of kids actually getting out of one of the classroom windows. And it's a it's not a second floor window. I think the school's just one floor, but it's fairly high. But there's a few of them jumping out in this video here. They got that they're each other, that they're alive. The boys were crying very hard and saying our friends are dead. Today. Angelique Gomez says she'll never forget reuniting with her two sons at Rob Elementary, a place she's been to for years, but this time having to run past officers to make it inside to get her kids out of harm's way. I left work and did their job for my two sons, so they did it. They felt me. They felt me and my sons and all the rest who died and the kids who were in the building and that are traumatized by it now. Are you in there? She, along with other parents, cried and begged officers to run in. Gomez was handcuffed briefly for not cooperating. After being let go, she jumped a fence and went into the school not once, but twice. It's something that EPS... Can I just say, uh, this woman has uh, balls, because I, I don't know if I could do that. Uh, I, especially in Canada, um, I, I just feel like I'd be like, you know, oh, okay. It's, again, I don't know what the situation would be in that... Uh, if it did happen, but uh, good for her. That's all I got to say to that. And um, I, I would hope I would I would be able to do the same thing. Um, and and she got lucky that she w that they took the handcuffs handcuffs off her, right? So director has said is exactly what officers who were trained had tactical gear and weapons should have done to stop the massacre. While inside, Gomez got her kids as well as told a few other classrooms to make a run for it. Now a month removed from the tragedy. Some families are lawyering up. This is an unusual case because here you have police actually preventing people from protecting third persons or protecting their own children. Men that were, I believe, tased and pushed down. As a matter of fact, Angelique was falsely arrested or falsely imprisoned for a short period of time. Gomez and her attorney, Mark DiCarlo, are planning on filing multiple lawsuits in this case over law enforcement response and school security as well as defending possible charges of tampering with an active scene. A sacrifice is worth it. Living and breathing is worth it. At this time, both Gomez and her attorneys say they're in no rush to file the lawsuits because they want to make sure they have all the information needed for taking this case to district court. So what do you guys think of that situation? Now, uh, I'm glad she did what she did, right? Because obviously the cops were in the wrong in this situation. Um, in my opinion, uh, so she made, obviously she made the right move. Now, if this happens again, and the more people, now this was from a, an ABC affiliate. I think it's called, what's it called here? Um, I can't see what it says. It just says uh, something 12. It's from a, it's from a, a local station there. Um, but uh, if this happens again, uh, I bet you any money you're not the parent parents are not gonna uh, stand by the next time. Do you know what I mean? Now the only way you're gonna be the cops will be able to stop the parents from going in is obviously if they cuff them, then then they're kind of screwed, right? But this is this is gonna be very interesting, and it kind of makes me wonder. Like, it, it, I don't know. It doesn't. It sounds. Um, I feel like she's not making this up. I could be wrong, but. Uh, and if you think about it logically, obviously the uh, the police don't want that getting out, right? That she was able to go in and save her own kids um, while she was handcuffed and then she just defied them anyway. Because then you have, uh, if there's another situation like this, there, it, you know, you're going to get more parents doing that, right? And the cops want to have the control of the, of the scene and all that. But um, give me your take on that. What do you think of that situation? Do you think she's making it up? Do you think... Uh, um, uh, and not making it up. What I mean is, do you think she's making it up that the cops are harassing her right now? Honestly, I wouldn't be a bit surprised. All right, this next thing I want to talk about, this is from uh, my buddy again, Colian Noir. He's not actually my buddy. I just, uh, I like listening to him. Um, so he uh, gives some, uh, shed some light on the Supreme Court's gun ruling with, uh, if in case you didn't hear, um, 
New York, uh, if you're if you live in New York, you, you no longer have to go through like this huge process to get a conceal and carry uh, permit. Um, he'll go into more details about it, but basically what the rule was before is uh, to get a conceal and carry permit, you have to go through all these hoops and stuff like that, but now uh, it won't be as uh, difficult to get it. So I'll let him uh, explain. Has just made a decision about New York's concealed carry law. Now, if you're not familiar with New York's concealed carry laws, essentially, if you wanted to get a concealed carry license in New York, you could not get one if you wanted it for self-defense. You can get what they call a restricted license to go to a gun range or to carry a gun when you're out hunting or something of that sort. But if you wanted to get a concealed carry license to carry a gun for protection when you're out about in public, you couldn't get one. Except unless you had a special need, as they like to call it. That's uh, very, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's very similar to what we have in Canada. Um, as far as the self-defense thing, uh, I think... I can't. I read. I think I read somewhere in Canada. There's only like two individuals or something like that who are actually allowed to carry it, to carry it for like self protection. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, but they actually got approved for it. Uh, but again, I could be wrong. But I could have sworn I read that in one of the uh, one of the firearms journals there. And essentially, what that means is, unless you're like a celebrity, a political figure, or you have a ton of money. You could not get a license to carry a gun just for self-protection. Now, in this case, the two guys who actually were suing for this case, one of them was able to get a bit of a less restriction in that he was allowed to carry it to and from work, but that was it. But he still felt that that was a problem because he's like, why can't I carry a gun general purpose to protect my life? Because I never know when I might need it to protect my life. Anybody with a brain understands this, but because New York doesn't respect the Second Amendment, or the leaders in New York don't believe in the Second Amendment because they think somehow because they are a metropolitan area, the Second Amendment doesn't apply to people living in cities. They won't allow you to do this. So they sued, these two guys sued all the way up to the Supreme Court to where we are now here today. And let's just say that like liberals and Democrats were freaking out. And even I, I have a little uh, text group of buddies that I talk to. Uh, we run a hockey pool together. And... Uh, um, we're about 50, 50, which is kind of, I guess where the country's at, uh, me and my other, my one buddy were basically for this. And then the other two were like, Oh, it's going to cause so much, so much, uh, violence and all that. And, um, um, I don't know. I, I, I personally, I think you should have the right to defend yourself. Um, and I wish we were able to do that in Canada, um, which is just ridiculous. I think our, our laws are almost too restrictive here. Uh, let's just continue. Now, New York is not the only state that has this. There are about six other states and a bunch of cities that have this type of special needs requirement in order to get a license to carry for self-defense. Now, keep this in mind. There are about six states like that in other cities. However, the way these states are broken down is there's a shall issue state and a may issue state. These states that have this special requirement are called may issue. They may give you a license if they feel you have a justified need to have it. Then you have the shall issue states where basically is they have some basic fundamental requirements. And once you meet those requirements, you're automatically are giving a license, you're given a license to carry for self-defense. What this ruling does now is basically remove that whole may issue requirement. And now it is a shall issue. So New York needs to go and establish certain requirements that automatically allow people to carry a firearm once they meet those baseline requirements. So so again, so what he's saying is the thing that's happening in New York now, it's not going to be subjective. As long as you meet the requirements that they set out, then um, they, you, you will, you shall, um, I found it hard to understand what he was saying there. Um, you shall get your license as long as you meet those requirements. So I'm assuming that would be like a background check and stuff like that. Here's what the Supreme Court did to determine whether or not New York's law was in violation of the Constitution. They started by saying, look, does this special need restrict people's rights under the plain language of the Constitution, i.e. the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And if it does actually do this, does this restriction fall in line with the historical understanding of regulating the Second Amendment? So what the court did was actually go back and look through seven centuries of documentation to determine whether or not there's actual historical context where there was restricting people's right to carry a firearm based purely on the notion that they were carrying one for self-defense. The court recognized, yes, there were some restrictions. However, there's no historical context 
where they actually restricted people's right to carry a firearm purely based on the ability to do so for self-defense. There are other reasons, but not because I wanted to carry one for self-defense. It's too broad. So New York's argument against this was, well, no, we want to prevent people from carrying guns in what they determined to be sensitive places. Essentially, New York's trying to say, because we are an urban environment and we have a lot of people, we don't want people carrying firearms because we think it's dangerous. And therefore, carrying guns in public in New York is considered a sensitive place. The court said, uh, yeah, there is some historical context in that you couldn't carry guns in government buildings and schools and so forth and so on. But to say that simply being in a public space in a city, that would literally mean that anybody in a city would not have the ability to carry a firearm. And we all know the criminals don't care about these laws. So right away, they're, they have an advantage over everybody. If the New York law was applied the way that they want to apply it, then no one in the city would be able to carry a firearm, i.e. restricting your right under the Second Amendment immensely. At the end of the- now, I just want to say, I have said this before, but again, if you're new to this podcast, um, uh, I am very pro Second Amendment. I wish we had something like it in Canada. Um, because I do feel like with all this red, like uh, the registration that's happening, what they're trying to do with the long gun uh, registry and all that stuff, I feel like they eventually they do want to uh, take our guns, whether it's a buyback program or whatever. Uh, so I do wish that we uh, had some kind of a Second Amendment um, in Canada, because, again, you see. You see all these shootings that are happening in Toronto, recent carjackings going on. There was recently a shooting in Oslo that happened. That was in Norway at the, the Pride Parade there. And, um, you know, uh, I, I just think we should, we should have the right to, we should have the right to defend ourselves. Today with the court said, was, look, look, we look here, it says right to keep and bear arms. The right of people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So it's plain as day, bear, bear meaning to actually carry a firearm. So that's within the Second Amendment. And then on top of that, we have no history of the ability to carry firearms for self-protection being restricted. Yes, they were restricted for other things, but not for simply wanting to have one for self-defense. What's interesting was the dissent. The, the dissent essentially read, honestly, like it was written by the anti-gun lobby. They didn't make any legal argument as to why you shouldn't be able to carry a firearm for self-defense. They simply said, we have a bunch of people who are dying every year from gun violence, and therefore, New York has a right to try to do what they need to do in order to stave off those gun deaths. And we do that in Canada as well. Whenever you hear Mendicino talk about, like, uh, you know, uh, there's increased uh, gun violence happening uh, with handguns and all that. Uh, He's basically lumping us as uh, licensed gun owners in with criminals as well, because uh, as far as I know, anyway, now correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure they don't. Stats can doesn't stipulate like who is getting killed with uh, in, in criminal um, criminal acts and then who's getting killed by law guiding gun, owner, uh, gun owners. I'm pretty sure they just lump us all in. But correct me if I'm wrong on that. But then Alito came back in and wrote a concurring opinion, and he was like, uh, that's actually why people should be allowed to carry a firearm, because there are these actual threats to people. And that is historical. People carry a firearm to protect themselves. So why would you then restrict people's ability to carry a firearm when they want to carry it to protect themselves? That makes no sense. So what New York is going to do now is try to restrict as many places as possible from people carrying firearms. And I have to make sure that we can get the law changed in place in a couple of days to be able to have restrictions and to talk about sensitive places. We have the right to stop concealed carries from individuals from carrying a gun into a, a, a sensitive place. I'm going to define those sensitive places. I assure you, we are not going to allow this to happen on our subways. We just had a shooting a few weeks ago. I'm not going to allow it in your schools. Or I'm guessing that shooting was uh, a gang member or somebody who had an illegal gun. Churches or all kinds of places. So we're going to be crafting that language right now. Which is going to make it so tough for people to carry firearms because they never know where they're going to go and whether or not they can come in or not come in with their firearms. 
They're going to make it so hard that people are going to be like, there's almost no point. Yes, you technically can carry a firearm in the public. And yes, technically, I have a concealed carry permit that allows me to carry my firearm. But what's going to happen is if I then get on, if I need to go somewhere, and we all know that New York heavily relies on public transportation, but I'm not going to be able to go anywhere because I can't use the subway now because I'm carrying a firearm because New York is calling it a sensitive place. And then from there, I can't go into any other buildings because what they're going to do is they're going to say, well, this building is considered a sensitive place and therefore you can't carry a firearm. Then we're honestly going to be right back where we are now and having to deal with whether or not these types of restrictions are actually an infringement on our rights. So the bottom line is make sure if you ever move to the United States, live in a red state. Um, I, I've talked to my wife and uh, um, a couple of other people during the COVID crap about moving to Florida and stuff like that. I, I obviously don't have the cash to do that right now. But uh, um, over the last two years, I've realized how important freedom is and how important the ability to protect yourself is. Um, it was a funny thing. One of the one of my subscribers um, mentioned, uh, asked me a question in the comments the other day saying, oh, because uh, I, I did a short with my CZ P10F. Um, and I, I can't remember the name of the short. It was called like, uh, I, I was pretending to put it to bed, right? And just like giving it a little tuck and all that. Anyway, uh, it was just trying to be a funny video. And um, the the subscriber said, I'm not going to mention his name, but the subscriber said, uh, uh, oh, uh, that looks like a great um, nightstand gun. Uh, what do you use for your nightstand gun? And basically, in, uh, for, for you guys in the U.S. who don't know, in Canada, we cannot have a restricted firearm uh, on our nightstand. Um, I mean, I guess technically if you had a safe right next to you, you could, it, um, and then it has to have a trigger lock on it as well. That's how restricted we are, and it has to be unloaded as well. Um, so you guys in the States uh, are definitely have the advantage as far as uh, protecting yourselves. Now, the same rules don't apply for unrestricted guns. They just have to be unloaded, uh, but then a, a whole new thing comes into play if you have kids in the house and all that stuff. So uh, it was an interesting question and go all the way through the process once again. So even though this is a major win, we are not out of the water yet because New York is gonna do everything in its power to make carrying a firearm, even with a concealed carry permit, as hard and arduous as possible, that it's almost going to be pointless. So that's how New York is gonna play this game. Right now they're saying, do you have a special need? Court said, no, you can't use that, that's unconstitutional to give out permits or not give out permits. So New York's like, okay, cool, we'll give people, they're gonna say, cool, we're gonna give people the ability to get these permits. Here, you can have a permit to carry a gun for self-protection, but guess what? You can't carry it here, 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 and here because they're considered special places. And therefore, you can't carry your guns there. But you can carry your gun everywhere else. See, we gave them permits. That's exactly what New York is going to do. And this is for all the people who are in the middle. I want you to listen and I want you to watch the way that the people who are pushing for gun control are reacting to this decision. Because this decision is saying nothing more than, yes, people have a right to carry a firearm to protect themselves in public. That is literally all this case is saying. Oh, and I guarantee the libs and the Democrats are freaking out over this too, just like all of the abortion stuff in the States. Um, you ever notice how uh, liberal and Democrat protests as well always seem to get out of hand? Or... Um, uh, there's a lot of graffiti or there's damage done or whatever. Um, the funny thing is getting back to the, uh, the trucker convoy protest. Do you guys remember when they, um, uh, put the flag on Terry Fox and, uh, liberals were freaking out saying they defaced the flag, sorry, the statue of, sorry, statue of Terry Fox. They defaced the statue. It's like, yeah, they put a flag on it and they, it was like an upside down flag to signal like this country needs help. And, um, but yet these guys have no problem tearing down statues and stuff like that. And right now you have every anti-gun group. You even have anti-gun politicians and even our own president who is saying that this was not the right decision. So what they are saying is they do not believe that you have the right to carry a firearm for your protection. Speaking of that, guys, remember, the uh, if, if you do care about your guns, or even maybe if you don't even have a gun yet, maybe you're new to this stuff. Um, again, I've only been doing this for about a year now, 
And uh, like I only got my license last, what did I, I, I officially got it like last October. So I haven't even had it a full year yet. I started the whole, I wanted to get it a couple of years ago, then COVID interrupted it. And then uh, we finally reopened again and I jumped on it, but I got my, my official license as of October last year. And um, make sure you support these organizations that are out there because the anti-gun lobby is very powerful, right? The gun lobby is powerful too, but we have to make sure that they stay powerful because they are the one, what are you going to do? Go to court for yourself if an issue happens or you want to change something? It's not going to work. You need these lobbies to basically go and fight for our rights. Like one is the NFA, that's National Firearms Association, the CCFR Coalition for... Um, uh, Canadian firearms. Uh, oh God, I can't remember. I always forget what the CCFR stands for. Uh, Coalition for Canadian Firearms Rights. Yeah, that's it. And um, there's also the CSSA, which is the Canadian Shooting and Sports Association. There's uh, the Canadian, uh, there's, there's one's very similar. It's CSAAA, like Canadian Shooting and Ammunition, Ammunition Association. So we have a few of them here in Canada. Um, I'm also an NRA member as well. Um, you can be an NRA member even if you are a Canadian. Um, and I just figure that if you're gonna, if we are gonna make sure our we have gun rights in Canada, we have to make sure they they're in the states too. So I think I paid like sixty bucks for it last year, and actually they keep emailing me now to renew it, and uh, they they'll usually give you like a like a free free thing to come with it. Like I got a little little cheesy pocket knife, but it was pretty cool. It said NRA on it. And then I also joined the NFA and I joined the CCFR as well. Um, and the NFA is pretty cool because you'll get like, uh, you get a free magazine each, uh, I think it's every two months. I just got mine today actually in the mail. Uh, it's called the a Canadian Firearms Journal. I did a video about this uh, a few months ago, a couple months ago. Excuse me. And then um, with the CCFR, um, there's no real magazines, but they, they'll use that money to go to parliament and lobby for our rights. So whenever there's like, uh, uh, like Bill C-21, I know uh, Tracy Wilson is, might be testifying when they actually try to get that thing uh, going through. Um, and I, uh, I do have a Facebook page as well, guys. It's called Canadian Range Nuts, so go check that out. Uh, I recently put a, a, a video of uh, Tracy on there talking about what's going to happen specifically with C-21 in Canada because it did pass the second reading. So now they have to go into more of the investigations of it and stuff like that. But anyway, um, it, you know, even if you're strapped for cash, I mean, you can't, if, you have, if, you've, if you're buying new guns, you can't be that strapped for cash. Like I'm strapped for cash too, but you know, for some reason I always somehow manage to find money for, uh, for a new gun. Anyway, uh, make sure you support these organizations because without these, those organizations, um, it, it's gonna, it would be so easy for these guys to just take our guns from us. Um, and in Canada, we already have tons of restrictions. I really don't think we need more restrictions than, uh, uh, what we have now and but but the NRA uh, the NRA is a really good deal too because I actually get uh, um, every month I think it's every month or every two months as well I get uh, um, the uh, magazine called American Rifleman and that's actually a, a, that's a great magazine too they'll do like product reviews and they always talk about the political side of things and all that kind of stuff all right I'm just going to get back to this now what happened to reasonable what happened to I'm all for the second amendment but what, what happened to that I can tell you what happened to it. It was bullshit from the start. These people do not agree with the Second Amendment. It's not about making reasonable gun control laws. It's not about trying to compromise. There's no compromising because all the people who are giving anything up are the people fighting to protect the Second Amendment. And I will agree with him on that because I've had arguments with people in Canada, even my hockey pool group. One of the guys in my hockey pool group is like, he's like, no one in Canada needs a gun. It was just such an arrogant comment. And I was just like, According to who? According to you? You don't know what my living circumstances are like. You don't know um, what my hobbies are like. Like, you know, how dare you tell me I don't need one? That's like saying to a person, well, you don't, you don't need a car because you live close to work, right? Um, you know, it's just you'll hear these arguments. So when they – I feel like the, the conservative side usually – now we're, we're getting a little tougher in the last few years, but we always – tend to be the ones to compromise, but the left always pushes and pushes and pushes. Again, don't forget, remember the, they're calling for the defunding of the police from the George Floyd stuff, right? In Canada recently, the uh, Toronto police chief apologized for systemic racism in the police force. Um, 
saying that, you know, more racialized people were uh, uh, getting arrested and stuff like that. It's like, okay, well, why are people getting arrested? Maybe you should look at that instead of just jumping to one giant conclusion. Anyway, let's uh, continue with this. When you have a compromise, it's two people coming to the table and each party walking away with something. But when we talk about firearms in this country, they want us to come to the table with them and then they walk away with something and we walk away with less than what we walk to the table with. That is not a compromise. That is a concession. Read through the lines. Look at the way these people are reacting. They don't want you to have guns, period. This is not about compromise. This is not about own reasonableness. No. They do not want you to have a gun. In New York, you cannot get a permit to carry a gun to protect yourself. It was so bad, they had to take it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court held that that law was unconstitutional. People should be allowed to carry a gun to protect themselves. And when they said that, all the people who were talking about reasonableness, why can't you compromise, are now screaming bloody murder because the Supreme Court said you do have a right to protect yourself with a firearm. And they truly are. And even my one buddy thinks that New York is going to turn into the wild, wild west now. Um, and another thing with that, too, he's right about, uh, again, they, they don't... The, that side of politics, like I think there's I'm sure there are a few liberals out there who are like hunters and stuff like that. But let's be honest, I, I think it's I, I'd be curious to know how many um, I had a guy comment on my Facebook page saying, oh, how dare you? Uh, I think the, one of the titles of my videos was like, why do liberals keep attacking uh, law abiding gun owners? And he was like, well, I'm a liberal. How dare you put me into that category? It's like, all right, dude, maybe you're the exception. But for the most part, most liberal minded people, left minded people uh, of the left of the political spectrum tend to be. Uh, for gun control and they tend to be in general uh, they, they tend to look at guns as we don't need them only cops need them um, good example look at Marco Mendicino one of the other uh, MPs had invited him to the gun range just to kind of educate him this is I think this is two years ago before they implemented the uh, um, the handgun ban not the handgun ban sorry the the, uh, the AR-15 ban and, the, you know, the, quote, assault rifle ban. Um, Mendicino refused to even pick up a gun. Um, maybe you should try to be a little open-minded and at least put it in your hands and try it at the range uh, to give you some context, you know. But most of these people, they've already got their mind made up and they, they want to give us the illusion of compromising. There's no compromise there. And honestly, like, uh, that that's why I do believe we got to support – you know, even if you support one of the organizations in Canada, like the NFA or CCFR, um, if if we have, what do we have? I think we have like two million licensed gun owners or, some, or something like that. If all two million of us uh, help support those organizations, we stand a much much better chance. And I know a lot of you already do support those organizations. And by the way, I'm not making money off of this. This is just. Um, I look at this as as gun owners, we have to come together with this stuff and even as conservatives too, conservative minded people, um, because uh, we have, you know, we have all these like uh, splintered parties, the PPC, we got the blue party in Ontario and, um, you know, Maxime Bernier. Don't get me wrong. I like Maxime Bernier, but again, he's not going to win. Getting back to Canadian politics now, uh, he's not he, ha- he can't win his own seat. So. You can't vote PPC and expect to get results because not enough people care about the PPC. We've got to put all of our kind of um, uh, our weight into the into the conservative party. Anyway, I feel like I'm kind of going all over the place here. But uh, anyway, so make sure you do support one of those organizations because I, I, uh, and even the NRA, because, again, American gun owners and Canadian gun owners, I think we're. Uh, you, Americans, you guys have the advantage of your Second Amendment, obviously. But again, um, the, especially the Canadian gun owners, like we really need to be unified in this um, because if we're not, we stand a much uh, uh, there's much less of a chance we'll be able to keep our guns and you know uh, keep doing the sport that we love to do, keep going to the range, all that stuff. What are you going to do if they eventually ban the ranges? Think of all the jobs that they get rid of, right? Um, it, your gun's going to be sitting in your in your safe, right? So. We, we got to put our money where our mouth is. And that's kind of why I started this channel as well. Originally tried to start it as like product review thing. <clears throat> and then I just started talk. I can't remember why I started talking the politics. Uh, it just kind of went that way. And I still occasionally do like talk about the products and stuff. And actually, I forgot to mention, I just got, I got my Ruger Wrangler. It finally came in after a month. It took uh, the, I, ordered it on May 23rd. I got the transfer on June 17th. So I am going to do an unboxing video of that. Um, I just haven't had a chance yet. So it's still literally 
like sealed in the box. I'll probably do that in the next couple of days. Anyway, I digress. Let's get let's get back and finish this video. In public, that is the type of that is who we're fighting against. It's not us being extreme. You give them an inch, they want to take a mile. That's how this works. But they know they have to do it incrementally, incrementally, in incrementally. And remember, if you don't agree with them, you're either a racist or you're hateful uh, or you're, you're spreading misinformation. Those are usually the three things they will accuse conservatives of being. I was listening on the radio today. They're accusing Polyev of uh, 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 going with the trucker convoy and like uh, spreading misinformation. And I'm just like, oh, I was getting so annoyed. I had to switch the station, right? It was a more liberal station. But I was just like, oh, my goodness. Like, And a lot of people are buying into this stuff, right? So... They want to get to the point where they can ban handguns, but they don't want to give anything. So when they actually lose something, i.e. the ability to restrict people's rights in New York to carry a firearm to protect themselves, all of a sudden they're mad. That being said, I know you see the hat. I am the militia. Um, we before only had this design in our shirt format. I'm glad to say now we have it in the hat form and I'm pretty excited about it. Okay, I'm going to stop that there. So, um, yeah, he's just trying to sell the hat now, which I don't blame him. He's trying to make some cash off it, right? It is a nice hat. It says, I am the militia. Anyway, uh, yeah, it, he's right about the the left a lot of time. The, the rage, and again, it's always like screaming, shouting, unreasonable. And uh, for the most part, I find most conservatives are pretty... Again, there's going to be exceptions, but I find for the most part, when, when conservatives protest and liberals protest... Two very different ball games, and hey, if I'm wrong, uh, put it in the comments. I really don't care if you disagree. Actually, I like a good debate, um, and not in a bad way. Like I just, you know, if you disagree, you disagree. That's great. Okay, this next uh, video I want to play for you now. This is from uh, Greg Gutfeld. It says Gutfeld, guns are in the Constitution, and then abortion is not. So he compares. Uh, the two issues and how the Supreme Court de have dealt with both. Like a lot of stuff has happened in the last week here. Um, if you haven't had a chance to watch this show, it is a great show. He's pretty funny. Um, I'll just start it from here. Crazy, crazy. No tie. Happy Friday, everyone. What a week, huh? If you're a fan of liberal meltdowns, well, kids, this is your Super Bowl wrapped in a World Series with a Stanley Cup chaser. It's all sports stuff. Versus so first of all, sorry, how true is that? Because especially with the recent abortion, the if you don't know, they uh, the Supreme Court said Roe versus Wade is not constitutional. So they have they uh, basically are uh, sending um, abortion rights back to each individual state. And uh, what's interesting is uh, a lot of my friends on Facebook in Canada um, and even people who supported the trucker convoy are losing their minds like. They're just going off again, whatever mainstream media is telling them. And uh, it's, it's funny, but it's kind of scary at the same time about the meltdowns that they're having. Like I had one friend who thinks they're gonna ban all contraception now and all that kind of stuff. But the, again, like, like Colian Noir says, these are the types of people who we are uh, dealing with when it comes to gun rights. The Supreme Court strikes down New York State's regulations for concealed carry pistol permits, which allows... Right. Got some murderers in the office, in the audience. <laughs> but that allows more law-abiding Americans the right to carry in public spaces where not so law-abiding citizens are already doing the same. Funny how libs aimed at packing the court, and now the court is packing the public. <laughs> We go to the NRA for comment. Uh, this is a scene from the Three Amigos, by the way. Uh, it's supposed to be the NRA. Uh, meanwhile, the gun control lives took it well. If you're wondering what that sound is, that's a goat screaming. Frantic, miserable takes came in hot and heavy. But you may not notice, since these freaks are miserable all the time. But man, do they hate it when law-abiding people finally get the same protections as thugs. Apparently, the left worries that those poor felons might get shot when they're trying to shoot you. Remember, it's these idiots who push for defunding of the police and gun control at the same time. 
Like an intern for Andrew Cuomo, he gets squeezed at both ends. I don't get it. I don't write this stuff. It's disgusting. The system won't protect you, and neither can you. You're like a kidnapping victim after the search for you has been called off. But you can see why the left is pissed. Crime doesn't affect them. They live in nice places, have private security. So no wonder this dolt finds it shocking, absolutely shocking. Shocking. Absolutely shocking. I'm sorry this dark day has come. I love how they call it a dark day, too. And he makes a good point about the uh, defund the police, right? At the same time that they wanted to defund the police, uh, they also wanted to implement more gun control. And again, I'm going to go back to the BLM riots when that gated community was broken into, the McCloskeys there, and uh, uh, he was uh, th- um, he had a gigantic house. He's obviously super rich. And uh, him and the wife standing outside, there's this BLM um, parade basically beating their drum. You can look it up on Google. Just look up McCloskey plus BLM uh, parade or whatever. And they're protesting through this gated community. And he, and obviously they, he'd been seeing this footage of them burning down stuff for the last, like for months, really. I think it was months. Uh, God, it's it well, two years ago. It went by quick. But um, he's standing outside of his porch with his AR-15, and she's got her little pistol. Uh, do you think they went near their house? Nope, they didn't. And that was, that was I've said this before, but that was the first moment I kind of said, oh, yeah, okay, I understand why uh, they have high-capacity magazines. That kind of makes sense now, right? Whereas before, when I was more anti-gun, like I used to be super anti-gun, but uh, I, w- I used to – was as I tried to be a more of a compromiser before I got into guns, I was like, well, what do you, what do you need a 15 round mag for? What do you need a 20 round mag for? You know? Cause again, I was uneducated and I didn't think of these situations. And again, the COVID stuff really woke me up, um, to a lot of this stuff. Anyway, here we go. Mm, I'd ask what world she's been living in. Mostly because her eyebrows look like aliens. <laughs> Here's our New York mayor. This decision has made every single one of us less safe from gun violence. And we cannot allow New York to become the wild, wild west. Mm. Notice how they always use the wild, wild west too. Like everybody's going to be uh, uh, meeting outside, having, um, uh, what the hell you call it? What, what do they call it when you, uh, you, and I love cowboy movies too. I just can't, I'm drawing a blank on the, uh, a showdown or whatever, right? Um, yeah, yeah, because it's going to be exactly like that. Um, and by the way, whatever happened to Bill de Blasio, I guess he's not mayor anymore. Remember that guy? Um, I just remember him trying to convince people to uh, get vaccinated by going in and getting a free hamburger and fries. Like, how ridiculous is that? I'll tell you a story about that, too. Um, I was I didn't want to get vaccinated, not because I'm anti-vax or anything. I just, uh, you know, I'm 40. Uh, I think I'm 44. I can't remember now. I'm in my early for- mid 40s. And uh, I just didn't think I needed it. So I didn't want to get it. And then when I finally ended up getting it, because my job said, you got to get it. um, And I didn't feel like going through all the, you know, all the the paperwork of not getting it, blah, blah, blah. I had to do constant testing, all that crap. So yeah, I copped out. I I will admit, I, I I wish I was stronger, but... When I got the first shot done, I remember the I got a five dollar gift certificate to uh, I think it was Tim Hortons. Yeah, that's what I, I think you guys have Tim Hortons in the states now. Anyway, uh, it's like a donut coffee shop. I, I I threw the thing in the garbage. I'm like, I don't want your five dollars to get vaccinated, right? But I guess this stuff works. So here we go. Let's continue with this. Mm, that's an insult to the era and the Will Smith movie. <laughs> And the TV show. The Wild Wild West. Has this guy ever been to East New York? It's way past the Wild Wild West. John Wayne's horse would be stripped to its hooves in five minutes (laughs) if he rode through there. Look, I want to give you a chance, Mayor, but guns don't kill people. Politicians who don't do to keep violent criminals off the street kill people. And right now in the background, you're just seeing a lot of gangbanger footage of people uh, shooting at uh, in um, like grocery stores and stuff like that. Like at sorry, variety stores like Robin the Clerk and stuff, beating them up and stuff. A plot away. I deserve it. When you were campaigning for mayor, you were always described as a law and order guy. We didn't know they meant it's your favorite TV show. 
Maybe instead of going to the gala at the Met dressed like P. Daddy's butler. And there's a picture of the mayor, literally. He does look like P. Daddy's butler here. He look he looks like he's a, a, a criminal from like a video game or something, like a mafia criminal there with his tuxedo on. Do your job, okay? God, I hope Kamala is deeply concerned and troubled. We, the president, myself, many of us are deeply concerned and troubled by the Supreme Court's ruling today. <laughs> Um, it, it, I believe, defies common sense and um, the Constitution. I love how they always say it defies the Constitution. Meanwhile, the Second Amendment does say the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Um, that's pretty clear, uh, unless you're blinded by just your hate of guns in general or your ignorance of guns. Yeah, right. Okay, I'm talking common sense is like cat talking nuclear fission. Greg. <laughs> Nuclear fission is just a reaction where the nucleus of an atom splits into two or more smaller nuclei, which releases a huge amount of energy, even by the energetic standards of radioactive decay. Oh. <laughs> so obviously you can see it's more uh, of a comedy type show, right? Dealing with the issues, but uh, I do like his sense of humor. Could have to rethink my thoughts on Kabbalah. Fair enough. And what a poor Lori Lightfoot. The fact that the court um, is coming down with this decision. If you don't know who Larry Lightfoot, sorry, Lori Lightfoot as I'm speaking weird today. Um, she is the mayor of Chicago. It feels torn on death. And I, th I worry that it undermines the legitimacy uh, of the court. Sorry, lady. But I also hear gunshots make you tone deaf. Maybe see a doctor before diagnosing this decision. You gave up on fighting crime in the most violent city in the country and just banned cops from chasing perps. So you have no voice in this matter. And please, as a medical professional, get some sleep. <laughs> I wonder, I wonder, is Joe disappointed in the Supreme Court gun decision? I am disappointed in the Supreme Court gun decision. I think it's a bad decision, I think it's, and I think it's not reasoned accurately, but I'm disappointed. Meanwhile, Joe Biden, right, uh, with this clip is holding his notes. And I don't know if you guys heard this, but Biden's notes basically tell him uh, like when to stand up, when to sit down. Um, I'm pretty sure you could you could look it up as well. And uh, it'll tell him like exactly when to walk out. And it's like in caps. Basically, it's almost like it was for like a 10 year old, if as if a 10 year old was uh, uh, doing a press conference. So obviously we know he's not all there. Yeah, he's disappointed because he thought Matlock was on. <laughs> but at least he knows how we feel about him. Disappointed. I bet the view don't even have the words, it seems. I don't even have the words, it seems <laughs> stupid. No, it's worse than that. It's no, worse it's than insane. that. It's not even it's stupid. It is. It's. Like it's. Way, no, it's. It's so. It's such a middle finger to New York. Mm, no, it's the Supreme Court flipping you off. <laughs> but screw them all. Not literally. That's disgusting. <laughs> Here's why. They didn't care about the riots. They saw them as justifiable. They yeah, and I, I, I've mentioned this before in some of my other videos, too. It's showing video from Minneapolis in June 2020. There's fires. Do you guys remember the CNN video when the, the CNN reporter was uh, talking about it was a mostly peaceful protest? And in the background, you could see, like, the building literally on fire. And then all the stuff that happened in Atlanta, too. Um with the burnings there and they burnt down that Wendy's, like everything was burning down, like just ridiculous. They didn't care about black on black crime because it embarrassed their own sequestered lives and their own obliviousness to the consequences of their crappy policies. They created the crime and now they're mad people want to defend themselves. And they think that if we just sit there and be victims, we'll eventually all be Democrats. So you can't have it both ways. You can't do nothing to protect us and then prevent us from protecting ourselves, especially when it's our right. And dare I say, God given. <laughs> but, look, it's amazing. I'm agnostic. Except you gun control jerks made me into a believer. If I have to listen to one more vapid gun control idea, the next time you'll see me, I'll be wearing a clerical collar. <laughs> Besides, my abs are proof there's a God. 
But you defund the police, let out repeat offenders, reduce penalties for gun crime. The only thing left is the Second Amendment. Look, the First Amendment is enumerated, meaning I don't need paperwork to tell you to go screw yourself. The Second Amendment is also enumerated. It's a right that's inalienable, which is hard to say drunk. <laughs> Too many vowels. But it also means you can't infringe on it. And now we have Roe v. Wade overturned. And here's the obvious one sentence explanation. Guns are in the Constitution, abortion isn't. You can love it or hate it, but it's hard to argue that point. And I get it, not everyone should have guns, but. <laughs> He's showing a picture of uh, one reporter and I think, th I think this reporter, I don't know his name, I can't remember, but he wanted to, um, I think he wanted to, he said he wanted to shoot Trump at some point or something like that. And uh, so they're bringing up his picture now. And it, I think he's from M MSNBC and he's got like black glasses. I can't remember. If you know what his name is, put it in the comments. But this wouldn't be a problem had these liberal a-holes done their job instead of siding with the thugs. They let people out because they said it was racist to keep them in. Then look the other way when minority neighborhoods were destroyed due to their stupid policies. They made this crime ridden bed. True, we'll all still need to apply for a gun permit, but we sure as hell don't need your permission anymore. So as one famous cop once said, go ahead, make my day. It looks like the Supreme Court just did. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop that one there. Sorry, guys, I just realized there's more to that interview there, so I'm just going to continue it there. Uh, there's a couple of new guests in it now. I'll just let you listen in. So Dana, which one would you like to tackle? Do you want to do, I mean, you know. Uh, so that's Dana Perino, and he has another guy who is from the, who is a former Marine on there. Uh, the, the, the Roe v. Wade thing just happened, and uh, so I don't know, what's your feeling? Well, I think what you pointed out very succinctly, and I think this is the key thing to know, is that yesterday, when the gun case came out, the Democrats, um, liberals, people who were against that decision were like, how dare they? Mm. And then today they're using their same arguments to say, how dare they on Roe v. Wade? Because they're trying to make the same argument. Right. Because basically, as you pointed out, in, the Second Amendment is clear. Mm. And even though New York can have a law on its books for 100 years, that doesn't mean it was constitutional. Right. And so now you have a court that is willing to go there. Mm -hmm. And also gun rights act activists had told people, well, activists, People that support gun rights had said, you better not bring this case mm -hmm. to the Supreme Court because you're going to lose. Mm -hmm. That's what they were telling to the gun control people. They brought it anyway, and now they've lost. I do think when Whippy Goldberg says that, it's like, actually, the Alvin Bragg and the prosecutors like Gascon and Krasner, that's flipping off the citizens yes. who are, have a contract with you in order to take care of them. Then on the other side. Abortion is nowhere in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. it, there is, it, there's no Third Amendment. It doesn't say the Fourth Amendment. It's not, it's not about uh, abortion. And so now it doesn't mean that there's no abortion ever in the United States. It means the states get to now have a shot at it. If you live in New York State, nothing changes for you. Right. If you live in California, nothing changes for you, except for Gavin Newsom wants to make California an abortion destination, mm. which if you're working in the Tourism Bureau, you probably never thought you would make a, bureau, uh, like a brochure. <laughs> yes. For uh, that they were actually I was reading some things they want to do that in Canada as well and a lot of people on Twitter saying um, they were trying to use code for like uh, attracting people here to get them abortions and stuff like that uh, no matter where you where you fall on this issue though it's good points about the constitutionality of it um, and it again it comes back to that uh, lefty mindset that uh, you know you disagree with them they'll fight you tooth and nail no matter what right I like what she said about how um, they're using the same argument for the abortion thing and for the gun rights thing, right? Um, like the how dare you argument. Um, uh, because again, like she says, the Second Amendment's in the Constitution, but the, uh, the, the abort, there's not, like the Constitution doesn't talk, say anything about uh, uh, abortion, right? So um, anyway, let's keep going with this. For that. Hey, God, I'm not taking that cruise. That's right. So um, <laughs> there are a lot of... Um, there's a lot of misconceptions, there's a lot of hyperbole, there's a lot of media misconceptions that's gonna continue. But I also will point out one last thing. If people think this will change anything in the midterms, I think that they're wrong. In Virginia, when, it, it, remember the Youngkin yeah. win? 60% of people who said that abortion was their number one issue 
and Terry McCullough tried to make that an issue in Virginia, 60% of them voted for Youngkin. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily think that this gets the Democrats where they want to be electorally. They voted for Youngkin then? The Supreme <laughs> Court voted for Youngkin. I should have. I, I honestly don't know how anybody at this point <clears throat> could vote for a Democrat or a liberal or even the NDP because uh, all those policies uh, have led us to high taxes. They've led us to inflation. Uh, they, they want gun control. Um, they're soft on criminals. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't see how anybody can continue <clears throat> to vote Democrat or liberal. And I mean, I know that some people just grow up like that, right? Like I know in Canada, uh, like my parents would always vote liberal no matter what. Uh, and they didn't really know why. It's just they always did. Um, and then I kind of used to do the same thing until probably until I actually got in my, in my early twenties where I actually started to work and make money for myself. And then it's funny cause you know, when you start to make your own money, you're, you're, you're not so willing to give it up in the form of taxes. Right. Anyway, let's continue. I really, really. Verbal, verbal acuity. Like you've never seen before. <laughs> Joey. Yeah. Great to see you. You're the gun expert, judging by your biceps. Ah. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to hang those on my wall. So this is the former Marine, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to put those in my gun safe. Yeah. Listen, um... <laughs> you're not going to do it. You're not going to do it. Um, I can't. Tyrus isn't here to make know, uncomfortable, know, so it's you. Listen, um, thank God. Thank God Donald Trump was president for four years. <laughs> All right. If you was that to clap for you, you could have just asked. And you can, you guys can say what you want about Trump. I, I would assume most of you uh, liked him. Maybe you didn't like his personality. Um, he had good policies. Gas was 98 cents, okay? And you can even look at the stuff that happened with Russia and all that, but would the stuff with Russia really have happened if Trump was in power? Um, I don't know, I, I miss paying, I'm talking Canadian prices now, guys. Uh, 98 cents a liter, I, I miss paying that amount. Uh, now, uh, I paid a dollar 98 per liter today, and that was on the cheaper side. It's been as high as $2.12. And um, in Canada, I'm talking to you guys in the States now, we have way more taxes on our gas as well. We even have like a, a carbon tax in there. It's just, it's just insane. Um, so yeah, like I, I remember I was very uh, anti-Trump at the beginning of COVID because I didn't watch news for years. And the, you know, the first news station I started watching was CNN. Like what a mistake that was. Um, and then once the George Floyd stuff happened, I realized, oh, these guys are full of crap, right? And just to see their, what their spin on things, you know, but when the, when the COVID stuff first happened, everybody's scared. And then you start to realize, oh, okay, uh, something's not right here. Um, but anyway, yeah, like I, I, do, um, I, I, I do support Trump. Um, and the best is when they said he was like a racist and all that stuff. And um, I remember believing it. And then when I looked further into the clips that they had used, uh, they didn't give the full context, context of the clip, and then they actually cut some of it out. Uh, and so that, that really made me super skeptical of media as well. Anyway, let's continue. <laughs> no, but I'm Is this serious. like Red Meat Friday? Yeah. We, you know, it's not like it's the opposite of Vegan Friday, you just throw under, red meat out. Under eight years of Obama, it was the Democrats' practice to throw it to the Supreme Court if we can't get the support. Right. When you worry about these issues, guns or abortion, those are issues that truly have divided us, or we are divided, and these issues have come to light as Americans. The reason why we're divided is we have two very different experiences. Listen, we live in a country that will let you go be the king or queen of your castle if you, cho if you so choose. But also, if you choose to be a part of the hive and an ant and an ant hill, you can move to New York. Mm -hmm. But those yeah. rights stay the same. Just because they're more pragmatic in Georgia than they are here to some politicians doesn't mean that they somehow go away because you move here and there's 7 million people in a place where there should be 7,000. Mm -hmm. that's, not, that's not the Constitution's fault. I got to say this, too. Um, you know, I never used to – I since I became like – I, again, I've always been a conservative, but since I've realized how much of a conservative I am, uh, I've really ha had a new appreciation for uh, for the West. And uh, like I said, I've always liked Westerns and stuff like that. But, you know, watching Yellowstone and all that stuff, um, I, you know, I thought about moving to Florida, thought about moving to uh, Alberta. Uh, again, just money's the issue right now. Um, 
but even like uh, Texas, I would, you know, basically for the most part, any red state um, in Canada, really your only chance would be like Alberta. Um, and even then, like we're, we're still kind of screwed in Canada as far as like the freedoms go and stuff like that. We don't have what the States does. Um, and I actually know a couple of people who did recently move to Alberta too. I guess they were just sick of all the, the mandates and restrictions and stuff too. But, um, really gave me a new appreciation for the South as well. Um, you know, got me into country music. I actually like country music. Um, there was always a few so- songs that I listened to here and there, but now like my cousins will always make fun of me. Like, and, you know, they'll call me like a hick or a redneck or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, you're damn right. You know, and I'll joke around with them about that. But it's like, yeah, I like uh, meaningful music and uh, I like what the the values of red states stand for. I like those conservative values, right? What what, what have the blue states given us as far as values and stuff? Uh, you can just do whatever you want. Uh, or you commit a crime, you get out uh, fairly easily. Um, you know, that's not a world that I want to live in. Anyway, let's continue. All right. So when we talk about guns in New York, the reason why I leave my door unlocked 25 minutes south of Atlanta is not because there's no vagrants around. It's because every vagrant in my county knows they're probably going to get shot. Mm. Right. If they come into not just my house, but any house, there is a part of our culture. American culture is gun culture. It's part of who we are. It's part of the fabric that put this country together. When you compare us to the wild, wild west, well, what was the wild, wild west? It was the taming of the wild, wild. Mm. And we and we had to have a gun on our side to have order in the streets. Yeah. All right. Well, that's what this is because the police aren't putting order on the streets. There aren't enough of them. There aren't enough people in this city that would want to do the job, much less be compensated for it, yeah. to get rid of the crime that's here because of the policies that have ushered the crime in. So it, it's a problem. Yes. People have the basic right to defend themselves in a bureaucrat deciding what day they're going to work and who should or shouldn't get to carry a firearm based on how well they argued their danger. You don't carry a firearm because somebody's trying to kill you. You carry a firearm so nobody ever does. Right. There you go. What do you think, Liz? You know, you're, uh, you're packing right now, right? You have, uh... Not like Joey is. <laughs> <laughs> Those are some guns over there. Um, you know, I'm, please for now. I, you know, just the defund the police push, and I, I always wonder why, how come it's not considered a civil rights violation to let a felon out of a prison who kills an innocent person? Right. You know, so yeah. it, it, so where, where was that? So, and then, you know, just looking at the whole debate, when it comes to how they're going to handle it in New York, you know, the permitting process is going to be stuck, right? Right. So when you think about it, you would, you would sooner have an obituary written about you that get your apartment renovated, <laughs> right? Yes. Because it takes years. So yeah. they're probably going to have yeah. this stuck in that process for a very long time. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there is, you know, the, George Will had that column. Everybody's talking about it. There's a trade-off between, you know, the Second Amendment and public safety. The frame, framers wanted both. There is a concern about that, right? Right, right. People course. want to feel safe in New York. You don't know who's sitting next to you on the subway with a gun, right? So there's that issue. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a serious one. When it comes to abortion... You know, I always wondered, you know, 100 countries have over-the-counter birth control, right? And so there is an issue about that. You don't want unwanted teen pregnancies. It could be misused. That That's an issue, too. But I always wondered if, if men could get pregnant, there might be chocolate-covered Advil in, in a four-day work week right now. But I don't know. But, you know, so, so there are serious issues. Yeah, of course. For, but, and it's, it's wild that they did it back-to-back in two yeah. days, yeah. right? I was actually thinking that as well with the the – how all this stuff just happened right away. You had the gun rights in New York and then you had the abortion thing overturned too. Um, again, just driving liberals uh, crazy. I want to get back to the point he said uh, that the, that Marine guy said about, um, uh, you know, being soft on crime in, in some of those blue states and stuff like that. I'll give you an example. I know... Um, we're in Canada. We're really soft on crime here. Uh, for you guys in the states, uh, I'm sure you know it. Maybe you don't. Uh, we're we're ridiculously soft on crime in Canada. So I have a friend who um, is uh, um, uh, knows these uh, two kids. One, uh, obviously, I'm not going to mention names or anything. One was uh, how old is she? I think one was ten, and the older brother was I think thirteen. Um, they would go to school, they would smell, you know, they'd have a, you know, so uh, CAS was always involved and that's, that's uh, child, um, child welfare services basically in uh, Canada. And uh, so basically my friend had known uh, the, 
the cop, so the cops had raided their apartment. It wasn't even an apartment. It was like one of these, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, um, oh, I can't, it was like a, kind of like a bunch of townhouses next to each other, right? Uh, like a little, little community, but everybody's like very poor. Anyway, so my, my friend had known uh, the cop who actually went in on the raid and the kids were basically sleeping on uh, like a mattress, but under the mattress, they had like boxes with illegal guns in them, right? And literally, uh, so the mom got arrested and then the boyfriend got arrested as well. So he, the boyfriend was like the main guy behind this. Anyway, um, the mom got out within a couple of months or something like that. She was pregnant, had another kid uh, from, uh, from the boyfriend. Re- I think about a month ago, got arrested again. So now those kids are in foster care. But it just kind of gives you an idea, like especially with the illegal guns that these guys had. I don't think the guy got out, but the mom did have an opportunity to get out. But now she's in prison with a newborn. I don't even know what happened to the newborn. Uh, it's my friend doesn't, doesn't know. But uh, just to, again, it just shows you how soft on crime in Canada we are. Maybe some of you guys in the States have the same issue in the state you live in. But uh, it's, it's really sad to see. And you could see uh, and these people were repeat, repeat offenders, right? It wasn't the first time they've done this. Um, anyway, I just thought I'd tell you guys that story just to give you an idea of, well, I think most of us Canadians know we're very soft on crime here. And you know who's out of the country right now is Attorney General Merrick Garland. Uh, so why, I don't understand why he's out of the country. Yeah, he's right now. Is he right now. He's, he's in Ukraine. Right? Yeah, there you go. There's your answer, Kat. You know, as a future Supreme Court justice, mm-hmm. were they correct on uh, the uh, Second Amendment, you think? Obviously. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've never understood how it was, New York was able to have the laws that it has. I mean, if I have a right to self-defense, that means I have a right to a gun. Yeah. I don't look like Joey. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I could be so easily murdered. That's yes. like, like, it's like you wouldn't even, you know what I so mean? So she's a, a very small female if you can't picture it by now. I mean, like you could even use your bare hands probably just kill me. These are things you shouldn't brag about. No, I mean, just look at me. Everybody already knows that. Yeah. Probably, some of them are probably thinking about it. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop that one there. All right, finally there. The last video I wanted to share with you guys is um, this is a vi- this is again is connected with the abortion battleground and it's and the the overturning of the stuff in New York again. And this is from the Toronto Sun. This is more of a Canadian perspective. So for the Americans out there if you're not interested, uh we'll feel feel free to to um, to leave right now and uh, you know we'll see on the next podcast but uh, this uh, starts with our friend uh, Biden talking about how you know outraged he is about the ruling of uh, Roe versus Wade turned over take a listen for the United States expressly took away a constitutional right from the American people that it had already recognized so uh, so keep in, it, so keep, in took- keep in mind a constitu- he just said a constitutional right but meanwhile, the constitutional right of uh, keeping and bearing arms, nope, that doesn't matter. But the abortion, yep, no problem, right? Uh, and again, wherever you stand on the abortion issue, that's, you know, I, I'm not, wor- not going to get into that too much. But the point is these people will do whatever they need to do to get their agenda going, right? Um, anyway, let's keep listening. Took it away. It's never been done to a right so important to so many Americans. But they did it. It's a sad day for the court and for the country. In what was an expected yet still shocking ruling, the U.S. Supreme Court has overturned Roe versus Wade. Now, there have been a leaked document suggesting that the Supreme Court was going to overturn this significant piece of law in the United States. Reaction from all over the world is in shock. I'm Adrienne Batrat. With me are Brian Lilly and Warren Kinsella. Brian, let's talk context for a moment here. The ruling today, as I said, expected. However, still shocking, but what does it mean moving forward? Well, it doesn't suddenly criminalize abortion across the United States. That is something that uh, that basically the ruling, which was a 6-3 to decision, was down party lines, could not do. The court's decision to do so will have real and immediate consequences. State laws banning abortion are automatically taking effect today. 
Uh, it does turn it back over to the states, though. We have seen some states, uh, Texas most recently, looking to put restrictions on abortion. You're going to see uh, a patchwork across the United States when it comes to abortion legislation. Some will have severe restrictions, some will have none. I can't imagine New York having any or California, but you can see places like Texas um, having, you know, if not strong restrictions, outright bans. Places like Florida, uh, despite it being a Republican governor, probably much more in the middle. So it's going to depend on where you live, as opposed to what had been the case of uh, virtually no restrictions. I mean, some compared to here, but virtually no restrictions due to Roe v. Wade. As reaction continues to pour in, Warren, the, the U.S. is going to be going to midterms. Joe Biden remains incredibly unpopular. His administration is unpopular. But does this help the Democrats? Well, that is the question. Uh, what is the political impact of this extraordinary historical decision of the U.S. Supreme Court? And I think we all know that Joe Biden, who, full disclosure, I volunteered for in his run for the presidency, he was going to be facing a pounding, Adrian, in the midterm elections, which are coming up in just a few months. He, like every president, gets in some trouble during the midterms, but Joe Biden was in big trouble. I think that this decision of the U.S. Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade is going to improve Biden's fortunes and that of the Democratic Party because they're going to be able to say to American women, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court and the Republicans, they want to control your body. This is what kind of scares me with this issue, too. Now, some of you might say, well, what does this have to do with guns? Well, it has everything to do with it. Well, not everything, but... It's pretty important because if, if this decision sways a lot of people to vote for Democrats in the states, right, um, that's going to affect us as gun owners, right? Even in Canada, because I, I know a lot of people in Canada on my Facebook feed who are talking about, <coughs> excuse me, they're, they're, again, I told you about the, the, the two girls who were talking and they think uh, this could come to Canada, this could lead to banned contraception and all that kind of stuff, right? So... Uh, this stuff that's happening in the states with Roe with Roe versus Wade could definitely affect us because now now you're going to sway those people. Uh, yeah, I, I don't I don't really know what's going to happen, but you could sway those people who may have voted conservative before. They might say to themselves, "Hmm, maybe I'll vote liberal because I don't I I don't want the uh, I don't want uh, these abortion laws to come to Canada type thing, right?" And um, uh, now, I'm pretty sure the conservatives have uh, said they're not even going to touch the issue. Um, and I think it mentions it later on in this video, but uh, let's just keep listening here. This fall, I must elect more senators and representatives who will codify women's right to choose in the federal law once again. Elect more state leaders to protect this right at the local level. We need to restore the protections of Roe as law of the land. We need to elect officials who will do that. This fall, Roe is on the ballot. They want to take away choice. They want to say what you need to do and should do with your body. And I think that that is something that will assist Democrats across the United States. We've seen Now that guy seems like he's a very liberal minded person. Um, what I find interesting is the same people who, you know, had no problem mandating uh, vaccines and uh, you know they had no problem people losing their job and stuff like that over not getting a vaccine um, are suddenly now back to my body my choice right and uh, the, it's just interesting to see how easily people flip-flop on these issues um, it, what do you guys think like what do you think do you think this decision decision could affect uh, the vote in the states. Also, do you think that uh, it could affect conservatives getting in in Canada? I had one guy, I can't remember his name now, but he he said he he uh, made a comment in my last video saying the conservatives better uh, be careful because um, you know the Roe v. Wade thing could really hurt them. It, it could. Now, I think our conservative party in Canada is has to be more conservative. The whole point of being a conservative is you got to stand by those principles. I think the problem with when O'Toole was in last time, he was trying to cater to every different group that was out there, every different um, person. And as a conservative, you can't do that, right? There's certain principles that we live by. So I do hope Polyev gets in, but uh, 
What do you guys think? Do you think this uh, Roe v. Wade will affect the conservatives here? Seen Brian, that since the leak that this ruling was coming out, a lot of Supreme Court justices have been targeted. They have been uh, attacked. You know. I forgot about that. Do you remember how the, there was a document that was leaked that this ruling was going to come out to? Gee, I wonder who did that. And verbally attacked, personally attacked. There's people camping out at their homes. Plots against their lives. And this is this is the 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 visceral reaction that so many people are having to towards it. You know, we we try to put these things into context in, in our own backyard. I don't know if we would see such a quite a reaction here as we would in the United States, but there are yet more controversial rulings coming from the Supreme Court. Well, they just had one uh, that overturned a New York prohibition on concealed carry for guns. That's going to a anger a lot of people. Um, what, what's amazing is that it, what we're seeing in terms of stalking people, plots against the lives of people like Justice Kavanaugh, is this is coming from the American left. We were always warning that it's the right that's going to turn to violence. Oh, yeah, and they always say that, right? <clears throat> if you're uh, these, uh, you know, they call us the right-wing extremists or whatever, <clears throat> and how full of crap are they, right? Even, do you remember when uh, the election in 2020 happened? Uh, how they, um, in Washington, when they, uh, all the storefronts and everything were boarded up uh, because they were worried about riots happening if Trump actually won, right? Um, so the left are, are usually the ones who, who do this kind of crazy stuff, like doxing of people and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I will not be shocked to see violence happen on large scale uh, across the United States over the coming days and weeks. I totally agree with him. I think I mentioned that uh, earlier in this episode. Um, I think we can totally expect like uh, another BLM type summer, and it'll you know where people justif uh, justify the violence, uh, saying, "Oh, this is the only way we can get a, a make, get a change done," right? Which I think is ridiculous. Let's bring this back home, Warren. Um, this is a reaction, obviously, that happened in the United States. Canadians feel it personally. So does this, in, in a political sense, just in terms of a narrative, does it help Justin Trudeau? I think it probably does. You know, after the leak of this decision happened a few months ago, uh, you saw Trudeau and a number of his ministers tweeting about the need for reproductive freedom and the need to protect abortion rights here in Canada. Even though the U.S. Supreme Court doesn't have any jurisdiction over Canada, there is an impact on the psyche of Canadian voters and Canadian female voters in particular. The judgment coming out of the United States is an attack on women's freedom. Quite frankly, it's an attack on everyone's freedoms and rights i find it funny for uh, when you hear trudeau talking about attacks on freedom it's uh uh quite interesting let me be really really clear in canada oh he said he said he's going to be clear there's the, the the red flag there we will always defend women's rights to choose and continue to work to expand uh, access to the full range of reproductive health and services uh, across the country so I think, yes, you're going to see Trudeau trying to take advantage of this thing. It could be cynical. It could be wrongheaded. could be a waste of time. But my suspicion is it is going to help him out politically because Canadian women are going to be concerned about the same thing happening here. There are going to be so much analysis that comes forward on this. The state's responsibility, what the feds have done. There's a lot of historical context here. And... You know, we, we don't have a direct impact on us here in Canada, but we have, a, it, it, we feel it. There is going to be that, you know, women are gonna be forced to go back into the, into the alleyways, the co-hangers, the, the illegality of it. How, put some of that in. And I've heard this from many of my female friends as well, uh, who aren't as educated in politics as uh, some of us are. Or maybe not, uh, they're just not paying attention to, to it most of the time. To context for us. I don't think that in the United States you're going to go back to, you know, the, the Margaret Atwood Handmaid Tale um, vision of America. Uh, oh, just for the record, the, one of my friends who I'm talking about, she actually has a picture from that HBO series, The, the Handmaid Tale, on her profile. Just to, just to give you an idea of how ridiculous some people are being.
some people like to put forward. I think you're going to see local populations um, decide where and where uh, where the restrictions lie. In Canada, if you were to ask the population, we would not have the situation that we're in because most Canadians uh, would actually prefer some restrictions. We have none up until the ninth month. And majorities, including majority of women, would say, you know what? After six months, you can't have an abortion un under except under certain circumstances. I think that's what we're going to see, um, and it really will depend. But we'll also, as Warren was saying, motivate Democrats to come out. The overturning Roe v. Wade has been an incredible rallying cry for Republicans for decades. Now the Democrats have won, and that will see Democrats and swing voters rally around an unpopular Democratic president. Um, Justin Trudeau, as is, is Warren was saying, he's going to try and use it here. And I think this is where the conservatives have to be very smart. Um, they still have to be conservative, but uh, they just got to continue to push the other issues with Trudeau, like the inflation and stuff like that. <clears throat> to Because, uh, again, we're probably not going to have an election for another three years. So I think in three years time, this thing will probably uh, die down. But I kind of, it was kind of disturbing when you heard about the six month thing, man, because, again, uh, I don't want to touch too much on that. But uh, if you've ever seen a six month like premature baby, that, that, that's like a, that, that is a baby. Uh, anyway, just I'm gonna leave it at that there. Um, try not to send too much hate in the comments. Anyway, let's continue. To that point, Warren, um, purely from a legal perspective, as, as you're, you're a lawyer and you've read through the decision by now, could something in this regard uh, happen in Canada? And if it could, like, what does that look like in our country? I don't think so. You know, the decision in Canada that determined the abortion question is R.V. Morgenthaler back in 1988. And in that decision, the Supreme Court of Canada said it's up to Parliament. Parliament has to decide whether they want to uh, put forward a criminal law limiting women's ability to have an abortion. And since 1988, successive governments, conservative and liberal, under a number of different prime ministers, have refused to open this up. And currently, along with the liberals and the New Democrats saying that they're not going to touch the issue, you've got the leading candidates for the conservative leadership, Pierre Polyev, Jean Charest, and Patrick Brown, all saying that they're not going to touch it either. So I think in Canada, Notwithstanding the extraordinary events in the United States today, notwithstanding all of that, I think that there isn't a Canadian politician who's smart is going to try and recriminalize abortion. Certainly a controversial ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court, but it won't be the last one. Log on okay, I'm going to stop it there. So, yeah, it will be interesting to see what happens with this. Um, and again, um, uh, what worries me as far as again our with with our gun rights like pretty much we uh, as uh law-abiding gun owners uh, we are reliant on the conservative government right and it's a good thing they got o'toole out of there because he was one of those leaders who um kind of uh uh what, what's the word i'm looking for here he he would um try to appease everybody right where we know polyev it will stand with law-abiding gun owners sure uh i I'm not so sure. I feel like he's a liberal uh, in, you know, what's the word I'm looking for here? Like a uh, liberal in sheep's clothing or whatever you want to call it. I know it's, I know the saying's wolf, but whatever. Um, so I think Polyev is our best hope. But again, I just hope that this doesn't sway a lot of the uh, uh, people who may have voted conservative to vote liberal the next time out of their fear. But again, we've probably got three years. I can't see Jagmeet Singh... Um, uh, Lee, you know, uh, betraying his buddy Trudeau and having um, have, having an early election again. But then again, you never know, man. Who knows what's going to happen? Anyway, I hope you guys uh, enjoyed that episode. Um, let me know uh, what you thought of it. Um, please remember to like or subscribe if you got any value out of it. And please remember to share it as well. That really does help to expand the channel. Thanks to all the subscribers who are out there. And uh, Canadian Range Nut here. And we will talk to you guys soon.